like three foreigners here, I feel a bit like on native speaking courses. <laughs> well, like I'm upper intermediate. Okay. Um, have you ever noticed that it is stressful to be Ukrainian? <laughs> kind of difficult, yeah. <laughs> I I sometimes think about Australia. I think about it a lot. What a nice country. No neighbors. <laughs> no fucking neighbors. <laughs> yes, there are spiders, snakes, but no Russians. Amazing. <laughs> I would take spiders and snakes and anything for living on an island where there is no Russians around. I think they they figured it out. They figured it out. Being Ukrainian is stressful because, uh, I don't know, the war is not what I expected it to be. You know, not like in the books or movies. Um, like there is tragedies every day, but there are also hookah bars open <laughs> for some reason. You can you can escape the rocket on the scooter with your matcha latte. <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> it feels like simulation. It's not real. You can post TikToks from bomb, shel bomb shelter like. Ten ways to have fun in a bomb shelter. <laughs> Trendy dances when the, your city is shelled. Uh, it, it doesn't feel real for some reason. It's just so absurd. And also there are Instagram guidelines. Ugh. Uh, I hate Instagram because uh, it's like it blocks all the content we post. It blocks even passport of Ukrainian. Uh, like it's sensitive content. It upsets the reach. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know I was supposed to leave laugh laugh during genocide. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm posting sensitive content, Zuckerberg. <laughs> this is very annoying because uh, everything I post about Russians is hate speech. I don't think it's hate speech. Yes, I think they should die, but... <laughs> When I post something that says they burn beautifully, it's not hate speech, it's a compliment. <laughs> there is a beauty in that. Instagram is annoying. We, uh, we need to live normal life or try to, and I'm trying, uh, we have to, but it's hard because there is always a voice inside your head, like the guilty one. Uh, for example, I'm doing a hair mask, something like that, and the voice is like, oh, you're in war. You're in war, Tamanya, you're doing a hair mask. What are you going to do? Stop Russians with your glossy hair? <laughs> what is the plan? <laughs> and it's so toxic, you cannot uh, do anything because it's like, ah, I don't know. Um, I think, but I think that realtor is gonna adjust to new times after the victory first. Like, realtors can adjust to anything, especially in Kiev. They're ready for anything. They will post new offerings of apartments, like apartment is a new building with a comfortable shelter. There are two exits, ventilation, it's ICAS friendly. <laughs> you can uh, deliver sushi there, it's fun. In apartment, there are no fucking windows, <laughs> only walls. You're like a hamster in a concrete maze, <laughs> $1,000. <laughs> I agree, I agree because I used to think that like huge windows is amazing in apartment. No, windows are overrated. <laughs> like you don't have to see them, I don't care. Um, and I think that realtors will add something to the contracts. They will add that uh, full-scale invasion is not uh, an excuse to not pay your rent. Because war with Russia is not force majeure. Read the history of Ukraine. It's like... It's like... 22 of them. This is just another day in Ukraine when you live near murder, this is what it goes. And then nowadays a lot of foreign journalists discovered Ukrainian comedians. 
And they're like, oh, how you do, fellow kids? I was given an interview to BBC Radio, was really pleased, really nice, but I thought, how did you find me? <laughs> like, did you like get interviews from all other seven billion people? It just, how do you go from, I don't know, Tom Hiddleston to me? Like, <laughs> there should be a lot of steps between. Foreign journalists usually ask one this specific question, how it's like to write jokes during war? How it's like? How do you think it's like? It's fucking amazing. I, I'm thrilled every day. Uh, no, I mean, like I'm doing stand-up for five years and the war actually began eight years ago. I don't know how to write jokes when it's not war, actually. But, you know, it's a sad thing. Thank you. Uh, I talked to my friend recently and he was like, did you hear that cryptocurrency market went down? Wow. I give so zero fucks. Like yeah, and I said like I don't give I don't I don't care. And he was like, no, this is important news. Cryptocurrencies has never been so down. And don't you have like your savings in crypto? And I was like, no, I have my savings in dental fillings. <laughs> this is where I st store all my money. <laughs> I invested in my ability to chew solid foods. <laughs> as long as I can. <laughs> Everything that is left after a dentist, it goes to army donations. There comes Pritula and <laughs> we need some Bayraktar, Sanya. Give us your six hryvnas. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's good. I don't know, hard to work also. I have a work daytime job, I'm a copywriter. Uh, and it's hard because like I have to look like I care about deadlines and all this stuff. Like I'm writing blog posts in English for foreigners about how to relieve, reduce the stress. I don't know, not be Ukrainian, that's <laughs> quite stressful. And it's hard to, th to act like it's an important job, but you know, you need money to live. And also, I'm trying to do my part by putting some small hints to foreign audience about what's going on. I'm like, small little, little hints, like hungry sucks dicks. <laughs> and my manager is like, Anya, but the blog post was supposed to be about yoga. Yeah, that's about yoga. How do you think they suck their own dick? It's Yoga flexibility. Thank you. Uh, difficult to, uh, to manage time. I have to be on Twitter like for 20 hours a day. I have a, an important job to bully everyone. Red Cross, United Nations. <laughs> Olaf Scholz, Emmanuel Macron. Those are my primary targets. <laughs> my victims. I love it. I love it that in this simulation we live in, you can actually DM anyone you hate. Like, could you imagine that even 50 years ago, now when I'm uh, sitting in a shelter, uh, listening to rockets, I just go to Instagram, open DMs of NATO, and here I am. <laughs> I'm writing bestie, how, how you up, sleeping, what you're doing. We are not sleeping, bitch. <laughs> no, no, take time. It's been only five months. Take time, Nato. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I realized that I'm, um, after 24th of February, I kind of became a political comic. I write uh, about politicians and organization, and it's not what I expected from my stand up career. I was planning to make jokes about, oh, it's so hard to be millennial. <laughs> You have to pay taxes. Mm. I'm an adult now, hashtag relatable. <laughs> I don't want to do laundry. 
And now I have to write jokes about Emmanuel Macron and he's a joke himself, so it's hard. But I think that there is something good in Macron and Scholz. One big benefit for two of them is that they unite us, Ukrainians, even more. Because there is nothing better than trash talking, right? <laughs> trash talking shit about someone feels amazing. Like the best feeling you ever get. Well, probably not as good as dead Russians, but still... <laughs> Still pretty close. And you cannot trash talk about your acquaintances now. First of all, it doesn't make you a good person. Second of all, we all should stick together. So there should be another target. So imagine you're on the train and you want to start a conversation with a person you've never met. You just say, well, Macron, <laughs> what a fucking cunt. And two hours of pleasant conversation if it dies down, you just, and what about Olaf Scholz? <laughs> He's a dumbass. <laughs> and also, it's been hard for me this uh, couple of months because uh, like everything can be is tactical information. So you should be really careful about what you post, what you say. Yes, you can't really say anything like there are, I've seen uh, military. No, you didn't. <laughs> and I have uh, chats uh, online with friends from other cities. And every time the Kiev is shelled, they write like, are you OK? Is, was it close to you? Where do you live? Exactly. And I'm like, ah, found you, fucking spy. <laughs> No, I was walking around. Uh, I was walking around city center uh, recently, and a woman came up to me and she asked me in Russian, uh, "How how could I get to Krishatik?" And uh, I was just confused. Oh, I acted confused, and she was like, "Well, Krishatik, the main street in Kiev." And I said, "It's not Kiev. <laughs> it's Khmelnytsky." I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> First of all, I don't trust anyone who speaks Russian, especially without any Ukrainian accent. Thank you. <laughs> Second of all, I've been living here for 13 years and I've never seen Kyiv residents being on Krishatik at their own will. <laughs> It's happened zero times. If you see Kyiv resident on Krishatik, it means the distant relatives have come. <laughs> and they are giving a fucking tour. <laughs> this is it. Let's go. <laughs> I, I was in Kyiv all this time. I didn't leave the, uh, left the city. And uh, at first uh, there was a fear to die, but then it evolved. And now I have the fear to die in a shameful way. You know, like on the toilet. <laughs> it's gonna be all over the world. It's gonna be all over the news. And I don't want that. And I've, it's hard. And now I can do everything in 30 seconds. Girls, if there is a cure in public toilet, it's not me. I'm like flesh. <laughs> <laughs> One of my biggest fears is that the rocket will hit my building, the wall will fall down and everyone will see how I live. <laughs> <laughs> and they will be like... <laughs> Was there even a rocket? <laughs> That's it for me, thank you so much. <laughs>
when little me was standing under the shower to long wash in my head, my grandpa was always knocking at the door and saying, Stop washing your head! Stop washing your head, you piece of shit! Wash your penis and your balls instead! And he was saying it to my sister as well. <laughs> just in case. Uh, I, uh, for quite a long time I lived in uh, one room apartment together with my parents. So I slept uh, in the same room with my parents. And actually, uh, there is nothing terrible here. It's great. You are not afraid of boogeyman. You're afraid that parents will start fucking in front of you. <laughs> Wake up in the night. Mom, dad? Oh, it's a boogeyman. Thanks, God. I used to live in China for some time. I can speak Chinese. Actually, many of my friends, they say, oh my God, Alexander, you can speak Chinese. It's so difficult language to speak. But actually, Chinese is a very easy and intuitive language. For example, coughing in Chinese will be... <coughs> so when I came to China, I learned two phrases. <coughs> and... <coughs> coughing and uh, democracy. Uh, in China, I used to work as an English teacher. And if you are a Ukrainian English teacher in China, you have to tell everybody that you are from America. <laughs> As the most terrible uh, thing for Ukrainian-American teachers at work is to meet a real American teacher. <laughs> I had such a situation. There was an American girl. She came up to me and she's like, Are you really an American? I'm like, yes, of course I am. <laughs> part of America are you from? I'm from Massachusetts, сука, блядь. <laughs> Actually, no, it's quite difficult for me to find uh, common language with foreigners sometimes, especially with Americans, because they're always fucking happy. <laughs> they're always so friendly. For example, I have a friend, I came to his place, and uh, he's like, Make yourself at home, dude! So I hid in the wardrobe from my drunk stepfather. <laughs> but not only American people, German guys as well, actually. I remember I was sitting in a bar with a German guy, and he uh, asked me, like, Why do we Europeans need to pay for you, Ukrainians? I say, good question, I tell you. After you buy me a drink. <laughs> I want some juice. I know you Germans don't like juice. But I still want some. And actually, please clap your hands who was uh, hiding in the shelter during the war. I also I was hiding in the shelter and I think that... Uh, the most terrible part, there were, were not the bombings outside, but sitting in the shelter together with people who tell you all this shit and listening to them. And I was happy enough, there was an old lady sitting next to me, and she kept telling me uh, all the terrible things, like, uh, oh my God, and, uh, are you alone here? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm alone. Ah, poor child, you little poor child, we are all together here, all our family is here, and you are here alone, <laughs> all alone, poor, poor child, where are you from? I'm from Kharkiv. <gasps> oh my God, and you are alone here, from Kharkiv. And all your family is in Kharkiv right now. They are fucking dead already. 
Poor child, oh my god, I heard there are so terrible things in Kharkiv now. And I'm like, it's okay, it's okay, I just called my parents, they asked me to tell you to shut, shut, in, shut your mouth, fucking mouth up, you old <laughs> bitch. Yeah, and then some time passed, and there was another lady next to that old lady, and they were reading the news, reading through the news. And one lady tells another, can you imagine a Russian soldier raped a woman and a, a baby? And the second lady is like, what a bad person. We should slap him properly. I'm like, are you crazy? Are you fucking crazy? You, you just heard the news about a Russian soldier raping a woman and a baby, and all you can say is, we should slap him properly. I think I just uh, left too early. I didn't listen till the end. I think that uh, woman, she was the Satan in the flesh. But she reveals her evil power too early. Like, I left and she's like, we should slap him properly. We should slap him, then cuff him. <laughs> We should cuff him, take him to the basement, then put him on his knees, take the spade after that, take the spade, fuck his fucking ass with that spade, and then take his mother, take the knife, rip off the belly of the mother, take out your guts, put them on the dick, and then fucking fuck her in front of him, that little piece of shit. You know, I uh, haven't seen psychiatrist for a long time. <laughs> and I feel like I need one uh, because I'm very uh, shy person. <laughs> and I have bad eyesight. And when I see the uh, inscription sticker saying Russian military ship, go fuck yourself, I just read go fuck yourself. Once I was taking a taxi, and I saw the sticker saying, go fuck yourself, I took on my glasses, and it was saying, go fuck yourself, you four-eyed faggot. <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, the sessions with the, therapy, uh, with the therapist, and during the sessions, I was uh, really saying, uh, <coughs> doing my best not to say some stupid shit. I remember my therapist asked me, Alexander, do you rem remember the first time your mother uh, kicked you? And I say, yes, uh, I remember. And what was the reason? I, like, I was showing my penis. Like, all the little boys do that. How old were you? I'm like, 17. <laughs> And she says, I don't believe you. So I showed her my penis as well, <laughs> for her just believe me. Oh, of course, I'm, I'm kidding, I wasn't uh, 17, I was seven years old. But, uh, but even when I was seven years old, I was a little idiot. Not because I was showing my penis, but because I was doing it uh, and our windows from my home were opened up to the playground I was doing it in. I still remember I stood in front of the children took off my pants, started showing my penis. Then I raise my hand and I see my mother looking at me at this moment. And the best thing I could do at this moment is doing like that. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, clap your hands who has a common dinner with your family, who likes to have dinner with your family. I also like having dinner with my family, and uh, there are always older relatives who always say the way it was when they were uh, young. And it always harder when uh, old relatives were young. I remember my grandma, she's like, you are going right now to school by bus? And when I was young, there were no buses. 
no buses at all. Yeah, we went on foot 10 kilometers. And then there's great grandmother next to her and she's like, and you were going on foot? And when I was young, there were no feet. <laughs> no feet at all. Yeah, we took the pterodactyls and flying to the school 10 kilometers. I'm like, grandma, are you serious? And she's like, ah, and flew away. <laughs> and I decided that if I become such an old man who is telling the stories, I will uh, tell some absolutely uh, bullshit without sense. Like somebody say, no, we went to the Carpathians, to the Yaremcha, doing the surfing, the snowboarding, and I'm like eating the potatoes and say it. When I was a young boy, I just grabbed the duck by its neck and fucking smash it against the wall. And that's it. <laughs> They're like, Grandpa, what are you talking about? And I'm like, you ask it yourself! And take off my pants and show my penis again. <laughs> and finally a joke for you. In my hometown, we believe that the bigger hands you have, the bigger penis you have. Doesn't work for me. For me, it's like the bigger hands you have, the more penises you can hold in your big hands. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You know, I gotta say, this, for fuck's sake, turn off the fucking AC. This is being filmed. There's always some fucking element of sabotage. Like, this is... There's always some fucking Kremlin forces over here operating, just fucking up my performances. How much better this is? No, somebody wanted to be cool. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway. So, uh, specifically, I think, this, I think this Putin guy is kind of shady. Like, I'm, I'm against Putin right now. Listen, I'm sorry if it challenges your political beliefs, but, you know, I guess if he wanted to annex this room, you would be for it, but you know, it's very sad to see actually so many people supporting Putin over here, but okay. <laughs> well, listen, I, I guess I don't judge. Um, well, for those of you who, because uh, this has been filmed, a lot of people are going to see this from different countries. I don't know if you know this, but um, in 2014, he annexed Crimea. Uh, sorry, sorry for the spoiler. Um, but listen, they had eight years to catch up. I mean, eight years is enough to watch the entirety of Game of Thrones and then start reading about Ukraine. So they had a lot of chances. Now, a lot of this stuff is going to fly over your heads because uh, this is not really aimed at you. You are just getting this extremely rare opportunity to watch some great fucking stand-up, but <laughs> not exactly aimed at you, though. Anyway, I, look, before you even say anything, like, I volunteer a fuck ton, okay? I will every day, I volunteer for 23 hours. Remaining hour I spend feeling guilty that I've done so little. <laughs> I have a strict schedule. Every day I wake up at 5 a.m., take a piece, go back to bed, and then at 2 p.m., you know, I'm ready to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, listen, the only reason I'm not in Territory Defense Forces is because uh, I didn't apply. <laughs> I've helped so many grandmas, I'm getting looks from grandpas. I'm, I don't really volunteer, but I'm doing something bigger, okay? I'm engaging in cyber warfare. So what I do is I go on Russian torrent tracker sites, I download a bunch of movies, and I don't see it. <laughs> yeah. This is a hybrid warfare. But you know, I, uh, I always mentally go back to the first day of the war. Um, and I remember I uh, got a call from my friend saying, yo, there's a war. I'm like, you know, this is one of those things where you just respond with one letter, you know, I'm like, okay. 
I'm kind of, you know, I'm a chill guy, okay? I don't sweat things. I'm like, yeah, no problem, whatever. I have this kind of DNA of a cold-blooded killer, so. And I go to the supermarket, I'm just thinking logically, okay? So we may run out of water. So the first thing I need to buy is some hand lotion. Because if there's no water, then how am I supposed to keep my skin silk smooth and exuberant? <laughs> so I need to stock up on food. Now, the staple of my diet has always been sweet potatoes. They have the best uh, vitamin profile. Uh, you know, sweet potatoes probably the best thing you can do for your health. And, you know, so I'm searching for sweet potatoes, kind of looking. And, you know, there's no sweet potatoes. I'm like, well, okay. I guess, uh, you know, nobody said it would be easy. <laughs> um, I'm like, you know, okay, I'm going to get some red potatoes. Obviously, vitamin profile not as good, but it has some better carotene. You know, it's a fine second option. So I'm searching for, uh, you know, red potatoes. I, I, I can't believe this. Like, there's no fucking red potatoes. I mean, honestly, I'm just like, what the fuck? Okay, I get it. No sweet potatoes, but red Like, is this a prank? And the thing is, there are mountains of white potatoes, but it's shit. <laughs> if I learned anything from CNN, is that everything white is bad. So, <laughs> look, listen, they love this war. Because for them, it's privileged people killing privileged people. So, anyway, it's white potatoes, and they are unwashed and not even packaged. So, I, I'm actually expected to touch dirt with my bare hands. I'm like, oh my God, this is not happening to me right now. Why is this always happening to me? I mean, what's next? They're not gonna have black avocados. They, guess what? They had avocados, but just kind of mushy, like the texture is off, I didn't buy them. <laughs> so already I'm pretty stressed out. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna distract myself from this bullshit. I'm just gonna get some Pringles with onions and sour cream. So I get to the shelf with Pringles, and like, honestly, like I'm not fucking lying. There's no Pringles with onions and sour cream. Just Pringles with cheese. And, you know, original, which nobody fucking wants. Like, if I want to, to taste original, I would just buy potatoes and fry them. <laughs> the whole point of Pringles is to give something extra, some fucking possess, some X factor, some punchline, as we say in comedy business. <laughs> but no, it's nothing. And, I'm like, man, war is harder than I thought. <laughs> Unbelievable. So as soon as I walk out of the supermarket, there's a sound of an air raid siren. I'm like, great. So now I can't even listen to the podcast. And I'm telling this to my friend. He's like, you know, in some cities, it's even worse. I'm like, yeah, somehow I doubt it. And then in the first, you know, it's crazy. The first days, how many people left Kyiv? Like how many people? A huge amount of just pussies. Like fucking, <laughs> yes, fucking cowards. Useless fucking cowards. <laughs> and before they returned, have you noticed how peaceful it was? You know, no traffic jams, no crowds, just nice. You know, quiet. You can smell the fucking roses. You can check out some cool bird houses. You know, fuck around with kittens. <laughs> Listen, for a good metropolitan city like Kyiv, it should only have like 500 citizens. People who give the most value. You know, thinkers, philosophers, artists, me. <laughs> it should be just 500 of the platinum society of Ukraine, me and appreciators of me. I mean, what are they gonna tell their fucking grandchildren? When they are gonna ask, oh, what did you do during war? They're like, ah, you know, I just uh, went to you know, Western Ukraine, it was fine. Um, actually found a nice slide, slot to fuck. But you should call her grandma. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, during the first day, already you could feel some of, those, some of those old ladies started feeling like they're actually able to spot a Russian spy. This is insane. So I'm going in my uh, apartment building. I'm already near my apartment with keys in my hand. And I just see this old lady passing me by and I can just kind of feel she's gonna cause some fucking trouble. So I'm like, you know what? I don't want her to know what floor I live in, okay? So I just turn around and I go to the next floor. But you see, she finds it suspicious. So she approaches me, she's like, oh, I haven't seen you here before. 
I'm like, do you want me to fuck you up? <laughs> People don't talk to me this way. And then she just starts asking questions. And I answer her politely, but without giving anything away. For one simple reason. Fuck her. <laughs> so she's like, oh, you know, I haven't seen you here before. I'm like, well, you know. <laughs> she's like, uh, uh, what flat are you from? I'm like, yeah, I'm just around here. <laughs> she's like, are you from this building? I'm like, you know, I'm just walking around. And I'm just thinking, do you know how easy it is for me to throw you down the elevator shaft? <laughs> But she just persists. She's like, do you have any documents? I'm like, yes. She's like, show me your documents. I'm like, no. She's like, oh, I got to see them. I got to see them. I'm like, listen to me carefully. By this time, tomorrow, I can have you buried. I'm giving you a choice right now. Either you stop this little questionnaire, and we just walk away from each other friends, or one more fucking question. And I swear, for the rest of my life, I will hunt you. <laughs> Maybe you'll be able to get away, to hide for a couple of months, couple of years, but one small mistake, and I swear, I'll put you on your back, like a pregnant dog on ice. <laughs> Listen, next time you leave your fucking supermarket with a bag of potatoes, and for some reason the bag rips, it's not that the bag is cheap. It's 7.62 caliber, American Beretta, <laughs> M62, initial bullet velocity, 865 meters per second, five bullets per magazine. That's enough to shoot you in all of your extremities and your fucking bag. So, you know, choose. Well, she excused herself, and so finally I'm free, I'm going back to my apartment, and then I go in the messenger, so we have a messenger for each building, and we also have a messenger, a chat in the messenger for each entrance. And I go there to see what's gonna be up with water, and I can't believe this, she wrote everything about what just happened, that fucking rat gave everything away. So I have no choice. I register a fake account in that messenger, <laughs> enter the chat and say, listen, I was there, the guy is absolutely adequate, <laughs> but the old lady, well, she's old. Maybe a little bit anxious, imagine some things, it's gonna be okay. But then some other lady in the chat asked me, oh, I haven't seen you here before. <laughs> I'm like, why are you also fucking paranoid? I've been living here since 86. I know everybody here. I live in the 86 apartment. She's like, well, okay, that old lady is really crazy. I guess I believe you. Then a couple of hours later, some guy writes, actually, I live in 86 apartment. <laughs> I'm like, well, guess we found the spy. <laughs> you got to think of these things. But, you know, it is hard, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, this is reaching millions of people and it's my responsibility to signal, uh, you know, our need for support. And, but it's hard to even kind of talk to people sometimes about politics, you know. You know how sometimes you're talking to some person and you give an amazing argument, just perfectly articulated. And instead, he just enters some metaphor for no fucking reason. And... Like, he's like, oh, well, you know, the government is like spaghetti, and uh, uh, yeah, we, we need the sausage of the infrastructure because, uh, you know, it's all going to collapse. And the tricky thing is, you can't just kick him in the stomach and say, shut the fuck up. You are now in this game, and you have to answer the metaphor and kind of defeat him from within it. So now you're struggling, you're like, yeah, but, you know, the Tabasco source of healthcare, you know, we got to make it free. Otherwise, people are just going to be on this plain spaghetti with untreated diabetes. And also, you know, don't forget the black pepper. Black pepper matters. And he's like, no, all pepper matters. And you like, ah, all pepper can't match until black pepper matters. And then he shoots you. So it is tough to have these discussions. You know... I'm trying to figure out uh, what's going on in the U.S. because obviously I plan on 
becoming a dollar billionaire and overthrowing the government. And uh, there are two parties there. One of them is uh, Republicans, who mainly, as far as I understand, consist of um, rich people who pretend to love Jesus and hate paying taxes. <laughs> and poor, devoted Christians who hate rich people not paying taxes. You know, and they hate each other, but they love each other. It's like a marriage. And, um, you know, Re Republicans are not, like, fans of uh, supporting Ukraine too much. And, you know, I get it. They're like, uh, you know, we have a shortage of kid milk. Uh, let's figure this out first and then help with the copper bombings of cities. You know, let's prioritize here. And I get it. I mean... But I will say this, like, I'm pretty sure there's a baby formula shortage in Kharkiv as well. So, you know, and also there's a war on top of this. So it's like two problems versus one, kind of. Listen, not here to judge. Look, the fact is I'm going to be the president at some point. And um, first of all, I'm really glad that young people um, are more and more, you know, kind of, kind of, go towards God, you know? I mean, if you look at TikTok, it's mostly church-oriented content. <laughs> and I promise to hear everybody, okay? So, raise your hands, those of you who do not believe in God. Don't worry, I don't judge. There's only one judge. <laughs> I'm Dmitry Polishuk.